All right, to start off this set, what we're going to do is we're going to create a database and a users table. And this table will be the space where we store users that we create. When a user goes to log into the system, they'll actually log in against the credentials that are stored in this table. And then people can come in and actually update or edit their profiles, their user record, in this table. So to add a database to your system, you have to keep in mind that we're looking at this from a developer's perspective as well as something that's portable that we can manage and maintain and work with in the space of our own application. So to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to use what's referred to as local DB for our database engine. Now local DB is part of SQL Server and what it allows us to do is it allows us to create a MDF SQL Server file and keep it within our application and then attach it dynamically to the SQL Server as we need it. To do that, we're going to go to the app underscore data folder within our web application. We're going to right click and choose add and choose new item. And in this box, we'll get three options. We have a SQL Server database option, an XML, an XML schema. We're going to choose SQL Server database. Now under name, it's going to call it database one. Uh, you can technically give it any name you want. I'm going to call this my um, WSAD final project DB. Uh, the dashes aren't necessary. That's just a personal preference. And this is my .mdf file. Now click add. And what will happen is Visual Studio will create that MDF and um, secondary LDF file, which is our database log, for our database. Now that we have this database file in place, we can actually double click on the MDF and Visual Studio will mount it to our local DB and it will open it up. So we now have a server explorer on the right hand side of our screen. And inside the server explorer, we can see things like tables, views, stored procedures, functions, um, any synonyms that we create, types, and assemblies. So what I want to do is I want to click on tables. I want to then right click on tables, and I want to add a new table. And Visual Studio will bring up its database designer. Uh, this is a little unique. If you ever use the database designer within SQL Management Studio, you'll notice that as this is loading, you get a SQL view of the actual table that you're creating. So while the designer is loading on the top, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the bottom here. And the first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to change this table um, label here and change it into whatever you want to name your table. Now, personally, um, I always create my tables with a TBL prefix. And I do this for a few reasons. One, it helps me to not run into um, keywords that exist within the SQL or T-SQL language. And that often can occur when you're naming things like user or users. Um, those words are actually considered keywords within T-SQL. And so by doing things like TBL user, um, I help to not conflict with those. Um, secondly, when I'm working within certain tools, you'll find that having that prefix there, it makes it easy to identify what kind of objects you're interacting with or dealing with. Um, also, putting the prefix there helps you to not confuse table names with column names later as you're writing queries. Um, that happens to me sometimes when I'm working in third-party databases where they don't explicitly put a TBL prefix in front of the tables. Now, some place, some people will say that, you know, that's an old convention. You don't really have to do it. I've worked it in both situations, and my preference has always been to have the prefix, uh, just simply to identify that these objects are tables. Um, it, again, it's completely up to you on how you want to approach it. As long as you're comfortable with the approach and you know how to use and work with it, then effectively. All right, so I'm going to call my new table TBL user. Inside of this table, I'm going to have a series of properties. I'm going to have an ID, and this ID will be my primary key. Um, before we get too far, I want to actually right click on this and I want to choose properties on my primary key field. That'll bring up my properties dialog. And I want to go to the identity specification property and then open that and then choose the is identity and I want to drop down and select true. 
And the reason for that is I want this field to be auto numbered. So as new users are created, this ID field will auto number itself. If you have a preference, you can change the seed value or the increment value. Um, this will start at one and it'll just count up one by one. Um, I'm perfectly fine with that approach, so that's what I'm going to leave it at. Um, other fields I want to add are first name, last name. Uh, I will add a field for email address, username, and password. Um, I will also add um, a field for is active and is admin. All right, now. I'm not going to keep all these data types as n char. I'm going to actually go through and adjust them. But let me kind of explain the fields briefly so you understand. So the first name field, last name field, those are kind of givens. Those are name fields. Email address will be the user's email. Username will be their username. Password will be where I store the password. Um, is active will be a bit field or a boolean that will then identify if this record is active or not. And then is admin, same idea, it'll be a bit field, which will act as a Boolean to tell me if this user is an admin in the system or not. Because I'll have different roles within the system, so I want to be able to identify if the user has admin privileges or not. All right, so for text fields, I typically prefer to go with a var char of 400. And the reason for that is it's a good size field, um, if you know that you don't need that many characters, then by all means, you're welcome to go to a smaller value. Uh, but the reason why I often go with a varchar 400 is that the varchar 400 is a field length that can be indexed, that you can actually include in your index. Um, there are restrictions when you create an index on a table that the index itself can only be so many bytes, and I, I believe it's 900. And by doing a 400 byte um, character string, whether that's a varchar or an n varchar, which opens up from an ASCII um, data set up to a Unicode data set, uh, you'll, able, you're, you'll be able to index those fields successfully. So for lookups and things like that. Um, the is active, I'm going to set that as a bit field. And again, that's going to then translate into a Boolean when we go into our code. And that way we can simply say if this person is active or is an admin, and then we can handle that appropriately. Okay, so we've got all of that set up and in place. So um, down here in our SQL, I just want to kind of confirm for you. So we've got a create table statement, and we're going to put in the DBO schema, and the table name will be TBO user. And then we have an ID field, which will be our primary key, and it is an identity column, so it'll auto number. We have first name, last name, email, username, and password, all treated as varchar 400s. And then we have an is active and an is admin bit field, which will be our Boolean values to identify if the user is active and if they're an admin. Um, I always also like to add these two fields. Uh, date created, and I'll treat this as a date time, and I'm going to choose date time 2. And date time 2 actually, oh, date time 2. Date time 2 actually translates directly to the date time data type within the .NET framework. Uh, there is a more standard date time, and that one can be used as well, but um, I've read a series of articles that talk about efficiency, and it's actually more efficient for the, the runtime and the framework if you use a date time 2, because then it can just directly translate between the two types. And then we'll do a date modified, and that way if we end up changing the record, we'll know that that record was changed. All right, so now that we have our table and everything set up and ready, you would typically want to go and click on the Save button, but because this is actually a designer for a SQL database, uh, the approach is a little bit different. What you'll do is you'll actually click this Update button here, and that will push these changes or creations into a script, and then it'll actually push them up to the server and execute the, that script that we created, that create table script, up to the database itself. So it's generating the script, and then once that script is generated, we'll be able to push this button here to update database, and that will then update the database itself and create our table. All right, so we now have updated our database, so our table exists. So if we come back over to our server explorer, click on tables, and expand it, we'll see our TBL user table is located there. 
If for some reason it's not showing up, you can click on tables and then click the refresh button up here and that'll refresh tables and then you should then be able to see or open tables and see your TBL user.